hi, my name is Autumn Payne. I've been a refuge student of Lama Jimpa here at Lion's Sword Dharma Center for about four years. Been coming here about five years. Um, so that's who I am. Uh, my talk today is on DEIB for our temple. DEIB standing for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging for our temple. Um, I'll have to tell you, I thought I was going to give an introduction. And this topic is so deep that, in fact, this is not an introduction. This is simply a start for this conversation. So um, that's my intention, is to set an example of a willingness to start this conversation, be vulnerable. It's kind of tough to look at some of these issues and, and see where we're weak, see where we're strong, and see where we might improve and grow. Um, I don't promise to have all the answers. I can tell you I've done a lot of research and have learned a lot, but I feel like I'm just starting as well. So my intention is not to be perfect here today in explaining everything, but to start the conversation and set a safe space and be willing to be corrected and have those respectful discussions. Fortunately, y'all are very nice people. So it's very easy to, you know, this is probably the easiest place to have this conversation. So that's good news. Um, I'd like to start with two quotes by Martin Luther King Jr., who um, these quotes have really guided me quite a bit in being brave in this space. The first one is, shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. The second one is, the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression by the bad people but the silence of the good. So I consider us the good people, you know, the people that want to be bodhisattvas and be of benefit in our community. So I believe that places more, more responsibility on all of us to take a look at these issues and do our best to be of benefit in our community. So starting with the basics, DEIB. Um, DEIB is something that's being put into work um, and practice mainly in workplaces to improve work culture. But studies have shown that DEIB promotes innovation, it promotes uh, creativity, and better financial performance for companies that do this. That's good news, right? Because DEIB requires something from you. You have to make an investment. You have to make an investment in your time, your efforts, and money to make it happen. But the good news is the payoffs, it comes back to you many times. So it's absolutely worth it. So diversity, what does that mean? How diverse a place is in terms of race, gender, sexual orientation, age, national origin, physical ability, and on and on and on. There are so many levels to diversity. Equity, how fair the environment is to ensure equal opportunity and access. Inclusion, making sure everyone's voices are heard and making sure that everyone's being taken care of. And B is really the, the latest addition to DEI and it's actually my favorite. B standing for belonging. And that's that secret sauce that, that occurs when you do all these other three things. Because think about it, you can actually have a diverse, inclusive environment and not have that felt sense of belonging, right? So we can make laws that say you have to have equal pay and this and that, but without that like actual community sense of acceptance and belonging, like, you know, that's, that's really the, where the magic happens. So we can absolutely apply that to our temple setting as well, even though it's kind of geared towards workplaces. You know, we want the benefits of diversity and, and we've expressed it as such, but I think it's important for us to define why we want diversity within our community. And the first step is really looking at what does our community look like now? We have not done an official survey, so this is just based on my perception 
but my perception is that we are a majority white population, upper middle class. Um, many are older, and we have a higher than average uh, childless or a child-free population. So child-free meaning those who have decided not to have children, and childless meaning people that don't have children yet or don't um, have been unable to have children. And so the good news about that is that we actually do a better than average job of supporting child-free populations because um, that is also another group that does face discrimination on a certain level in other populations. So good job us on that, but we do need to also support um, those who have children as well. So I, I would like to propose that we create a survey and actually find out where we're at and and you know, I'll have to talk to Lama about that. I haven't done that yet, but if I made one, would you all fill it out? Me? Okay. <laughs> all right, so sources for my knowledge on this topic that I will share is first, my undergraduate studies. Um, I got a degree in journalism, uh, graduated in 2004, and my focus in journalism really was social issues, race, class, gender. So a lot of my undergraduate study was from there. But after I graduated, most of my study was actually in the field. It was not in books. It was having conversations. It was doing stories with people, learning from people firsthand, lived experience, and documenting those experiences. And now, uh, Tamara Knox, hello. She's on Zoom. Everybody say hello to Tamara Knox. She is a big part of my growth and development in this area. She is the ethics advisor, diversity, not sorry, diversity um, She's the ethics, and oh, I forgot that we made a long title for her, and it's escaping my mind, but she she advises on ethics and diversity and doing things fairly within my field, which is filmmaking and documentary filmmaking specifically, and it's been uncomfortable, right? I've had to... Uh, reverse some of the typical things that I would normally do to provide a more ethical storytelling environment. So that's the work that she and I are doing. And I should also mention that she is paid to advise me. So it's important when you're trying to um, grow in the area of diversity that you don't just expect the nearest minority population person to dedicate their time to educate you that you need to make that investment in their time and them going out on a limb and, and telling you how it really is. So I said, hey, can I pay you to tell me how it is? <laughs> and she has. And my company has, has received many times more money in return for the money that I've spent on learning those things. So like I said, that's the good news. So I hope I do her well in this in this talk today because she's taught me so much. Um, another person that's contributed to this talk is Hoka Chris Fortin. Fortin? Uh, I hope I'm saying it right. She's the leader of Racial and Social Justice as Dharma Practice Group, which is an online group once a month um, at everydayzen.com. She's been doing leading this group pre-George Floyd. She's been doing it a long time. So um, she has been consulted as well for this talk. And then I'm going to tell you something that is weird, maybe, and that is I get a lot of information from social media and specifically TikTok. He's going like this. Why? Okay, so we're going to laugh a little bit and then I'm going to tell you why. Because there are not the same barriers that exist on social media that exist within the literature that we revere. Right. So the literature requires that you have an editor, that you have a designer, that you have the support to publish a book, that you have the degrees and that you got the support that got you the degrees that got you the support to write the book. Um, that you have, you, you, it re, there's a lot of barriers you must overcome to create a piece of literature. And then we therefore put that literature on a shelf and say it is more valuable than the social media creator. But some of these social media creators, like you can just, yes, I'm telling you to go on social media. You can search, you know, what's it like to be black in America? What's it like to be trans? 
What's it like to live unhoused? There are people that are getting up and they're sharing their lived experience on any group you can imagine. And they're having incredible conversations. They're, they're hosting live sessions where they'll allow you to ask questions and they'll give you their answers and you can just learn so much. These creators are wonderful. So I actually spend a lot of time um, on TikTok learning about social issues. After, okay. <laughs> okay, so it's important to invest your time and your money in your own education for this. All right, so I'm gonna share just a few words that I feel the temple should be aware of as we look onto us. This will be a review for some people and this will be uh, brand new to others. So first one being virtue signaling and tokenism. So virtue signaling, that's, that's doing certain actions to make yourself look good, right? And tokenism is, is singling out, okay, I'm a photographer, so this is very common. Make sure you put diverse faces on our brochure or in our video or in our newspaper because we want to make ourselves look diverse. So there's that's problematic if you have not done the work that actually supports that representation of your organization. So if you're not doing the work, but then you're picking out the one black person out of a crowd to represent your organization, that is not going to feel good to that person because it's not authentic. They can see right through it, right? Not so good. That's virtue signaling. You haven't done the work to actually represent yourself in that way. So we want to make sure we're not doing that. We want to make sure that when we seek to grow as a more diverse temple, that we're doing it because our intention is because we want to be a better benefit to our diverse community because we live in a diverse community. So we want to be of benefit. We're not just trying to say, hey, we're cool over here. We're relevant. We actually have to do the work, be of benefit, and then the brochure will follow, right? So the next one is colorblind. There is a problem with the idea of colorblind. I think it's a good idea to look into your generation and see what the topic was of discussion when you were going to school. For me, I was brought up in the 1980s and the discussion was, we're colorblind. That's the goal. We want to be colorblind, treat everybody equal. And that's it. We're good. There's no problems here. So the problem with colorblind is that it is in fact a form of gaslighting. We're trying to say everything's equal here when in fact it is not equal. Uh, people of different races, genders, they, they come to the table with different cultures and different struggles that are specific to their own background. And if we say we're colorblind, we're shutting the door to that conversation. So, you know, another example, Tamara is a, a a black woman, I am a white woman. In our company, we are able to have discussions. We are able to talk about her struggles are different than mine, you know? And and you feel more seen if someone acknowledges that your struggles, right? So let's put colorblind aside. So the antidote is, there's some new Buddhist language in here, okay. <laughs> antidote to that. Seeing culture, acknowledging backgrounds, acknowledging the burdens, having those open conversations, um, seeing people for who they are. So on TikTok, there was a nurse that actually explained colorblind really well. She says, I work in labor and delivery and I am not colorblind and here's why. In the United States, we have the highest rate of maternal death during childbirth and pregnancy-related conditions in the developed world. Of that, Black women die two and a half times more often than white women. That, that is significant. So when she finds a Black woman in labor and delivery, she makes sure to provide extra care knowing that there is less trust, knowing that there is more fear, 
knowing that there is a history that has actually led to her being more likely to die than the white woman in that same labor and delivery unit. So that's that's how not being colorblind can be helpful because we can be of benefit better in those situations. So another one, white savior complex. Anyone heard that one? The white savior complex? Okay. So the white savior complex is, and it's typical, we work with a lot of nonprofits. So this is common situation in nonprofits, which technically we're a nonprofit. It's when white people step in to save black and brown populations. We're the savior in our white horse coming to save the day for those poor souls over there, right? So what's wrong with this? Because some people say, oh, but I want to help. Like, what's wrong with that? It's like, well, you've put yourself up here and then the poor souls are down here, right? I've got the answers. I've come to save the day. Um, but here, here's what I would like to suggest as an antidote to the white savior complex. If you want to be of benefit, you see that, yes, there's oppression in this country that leads to black and brown populations suffering more than in my mind, the best way to approach that is to come to black and brown leaders who are already addressing the problem. And you say, how can I, um, what are your goals and how can I support your goals? And I probably have a very specific way that you can help support them. And that's, a, that's kind of a better way when you wanna be of benefit in your community. So you think about that, what's the difference in the power structure, right? White savior is like, I'm white saving the day. In this situation, we're saying, what are your goals? How can I support you? That actually helps undo some of the problems that got us into this situation in the first place. The last term I'll, I'll bring up before, I'm gonna give us a little time to sit. <laughs> it's five minutes maybe. Is white fragility, which actually this word is kind of on its way out. It's starting to turn into white rage, but I'm still going to cover white fragility because I think it's a little more applicable here. And what white fragility is, is white people being so like sensitive that, that they can't even talk about it, that they take it personal. Um, and that closes the door to the conversations that are actually going to move you forward. White women in particular are known as being particularly fragile in this area. And so some of the antidote to that is the meditation, the contemplation, seeing the issues and actually self-compassion. So when I look at this self-compassion wise, I'm thinking, okay, as a white woman, yes, I am more likely to be fragile because I have been raised to be perfect. I've been raised to be beautiful. I've been raised to be nice. I've been raised to get along with everyone. So if someone's going to tell me that I am being racist, that's a threat that's going to make me shut down because that that actually like affects my whole self, sense of self, right? Like self-worth. So if I can acknowledge that, that's that's doing the work, right? I can acknowledge that that's the burden that I have. Then I can start to set it aside and say, oh, well, what else is there? Actually, if someone can point these things out to me and I cannot take offense and I can have those open and honest conversations, then I can begin to grow and I can actually be a part of the solution. Um, so I'll give just a quick example. Um, Tamara, one of the things she's always taught me is just to ask, just ask instead of saying, well, what is the answer? <laughs> like Tamara, what is the answer? Well, just ask, ask the people. Because we, as filmmakers, documentary storytellers, we go in and we tell stories of marginalized communities. And one of the stories we did last fall was on the Native American Health Center. And that was like, whoa, okay. I don't want to do this wrong. So how do I do it? And she's like, just ask, just ask. So I told them like, we are the car and you are the driver. <laughs> And we will tell the story how you want to tell it. But before we had an interview day, Tamara said, just ask them how we should approach their elders. And so I did. I, I said, hey, we're going to be filming some elders. 
what, what do we need to know? And uh, the person we're working with, AJ, love you, AJ, where are you? She's probably not here today. She's amazing. She, um, a native woman, she said, you know, when, when you go to shake their hands, shake their hands lightly because it's a sign of friendship. In American culture, we're taught to have a firm handshake because it's confidence, right? But to them, it, it feels like aggression. And I was just so grateful, right? Thank you. Like, it's such a simple little thing, but it was a sign of friendship, like that I, I could express friendship to them easier with that knowledge. So I feel a great sense of gratitude, even if I'm corrected. And there were times when I was corrected in the course of the, doing this story. Thank you for telling me that. I would have done it wrong. And I would have kept doing it wrong if you hadn't told me. So thank you. It really is how I feel. So I just wanted to take um, just five minutes to sit a little bit with some of this and, you know, no specific instructions except to just sit with it, sit with your feelings and, and exercise like your own self-compassion around what you might feel around some of these things. And then I'll jump into the second half of this. So uh, we'll do six minutes, six minutes. That's what we do here. Okay. Oh.
Okay, thank you all for doing that. Um, let me just tell you how much longer that takes when you're the speaker. <laughs> yeah. Holy moly. Okay, but I did want to demonstrate that it's important to take your some space and some time with these topics to make sure that you're really taking a personal inventory about why you're feeling certain ways and and allow your story to be a part of of your own reactions to things so that you can come to the table in the right uh, mind state. So now that y'all are just clear and ready, I'm going to continue with my story, my personal story of some of, um, I'm going to start with my experience as a photojournalist, and then I'll make it relevant to my experience here at the temple. And so in photojournalism, uh, which is my first career, um, 62% of photojournalism graduates today are women. Of working photojournalists, only 15% of them are women, even less in the television news than in print. My college newspaper photography staff, which I think was maybe six photographers, were all women. Only one of us made a career in photojournalism, which is me. So I've spent quite a bit of time uh, thinking about this and wondering why that is. And I spent uh, 18 years working as a photojournalist. And it comes down to stories, in my opinion, about where we get where we're going. Stories are so powerful in our minds. And, you know, we hear that uh, I've heard some pretty awful stories about uh, sexual harassment within photojournalism. And there was always this joke in college that photojournalism was a sexually transmitted skill. And there were a lot of men there willing to transmit the skill, you know. But actually, for me, I didn't really have much sexual, not really any sexual harassment as a photojournalist. Zero at the Sacramento Bee photography staff. Um, there was some sexual harassment out in the field, um, which I guess is to be expected in our culture, but that really wasn't a deterrent for me. And then you hear it's too dangerous for women, this job. And I take a look at this critically and I say, well, um, I think all of us on the staff have been threatened physically or with theft and things on the job. And we've been in some pretty dicey situations, but actually assault is very rare. Um, one person was assaulted in the Sacramento Bee photography staff in the 1990s and was beaten within, the inch, within an inch of his life when he was working. Um, but that was 30 years ago, thankfully. So I don't, I don't think it's because it's too dangerous. The other one is the equipment is too heavy for women. Oh. No, it's not. Um, I will say that every single photographer on staff had a repetitive stress injury. Uh, the women did tend to be more shoulders and arms. The men tend to be their knees and their necks, but all of us had that. So it's not that the equipment was too heavy. But I've got my theory as to why it is. <laughs> you want to know what it is? It's motherhood. I looked at the statistics and what I found was that only 1% of women do not want to be mothers. And that's, we've been told pretty much in photojournalism, photojournalism and motherhood don't mix. And it goes back to the stories that we tell. So uh, there's not many stories told of women photojournalists that are mothers because there are not many out there is what we think, right? But Dorothea Lang comes to mind. She's the one that photographed the migrant mother picture. And we were sure to mention how she neglected her children. Um, her children were sometimes in foster care because her mother left so often, but the father did too. The father did too. They both left them. Um, so that's depressing. And 
But then more recently, there was a documentary that came out on Lauren Greenfield in 2020. She's a, a mother photojournalist who documents girl culture and wealth in Los Angeles. Amazing photographer. I recommend checking it out. Um, but they, be sh they, they were sure to include a segment about how she neglected her children for the job. So this is what we hear. It's like, well, if you're going to be a photojournalist and you have kids, if you want to be famous, you're probably going to have to neglect your kids. <laughs> Otherwise, you might just be an average photojournalist because it, they don't mix, right? I, so as a college photographer, I was very concerned by this because I knew I wanted to have kids. I knew I wanted to have kids since I was a kid. I was like, oh, dear, now how's this going to work out? Can I please find some other photojournalists to talk to? Mm, couldn't find them. So I'd ask other female photojournalists, I'd say, did you want to have kids? They said, well, a lot of them said I did, but I gave it up so I could be a photojournalist. Or they said, nope, never wanted to have kids. So then you're telling 99% of those college graduates that want to be photojournalists that they either need to give up the idea of having kids or they're going to neglect their kids because it's just not possible. It doesn't mix, right? But here's the other side to that story. And I'll just use the Sacramento Bee as reference. There are 18 photojournalists at the, the Sacramento Bee when I was hired there. Five of them were women, which means the Bee was a little more progressive than the rest Yay, Sacramento Bee. Of those five women, uh, two, myself included, decided to have mothers. So again, we're, we're really um, different in that area. But of those 13 men, all of them had kids with the exception of one. And that person was unable to have kids. So it was not a deterrent to any of the men but it was a serious deterrent. I, I believe that that's actually the root of why we don't have more women in photojournalism. When I look back to my college staff, almost, I think all of them had kids. And so then they're thinking wedding photography, baby photography, like something that's that mixes better. So why did I do it? <laughs> well, I... I kind of see things and things are told to me that I can't do. I kind of see it as a challenge. And I think like, you think so, huh? Well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to find out how to do it. And not only that, I'm going to find out how to do it. I'm going to do it. And then I'm going to teach other people how to do it. So I'm doing it. And I get women on a regular basis contacting me, people that I know, people that I don't know through email, phone calls. I just had my first baby. I'm a photojournalist. What do I do? And I can tell them what to do. But to me, I see that as an opportunity, right? I'm like, I can figure out how to do something new and then I can help other people do it too. But it's also really hard because I really didn't have an example. Um, so then it goes back to stories. It's like, okay, We've heard all these stories about how it cannot be possible. So let me imagine a story where it's possible. Let me imagine a place where I not only not neglect kids, but I actually do a good job as a parent. Let me imagine that story. Let me, then let's push it even further. Let me imagine a story where me being a photojournalist actually is beneficial to my children. What would that look like? So then I imagine what that would look like. And once I can imagine what that looks like, then I can start living it. And that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. So let's take this now to the temple. And kind of there's this monastic tradition behind temple operations, right? Where it's kind of like, if you're on the path to spiritual enlightenment, then you're going to probably have an easier time or have more success if you don't have children because you have more time to dedicate to the practice, right? That's that's kind of the story that we 
it's funny with stories because sometimes there's not an actual story to point to. It's just sort of like this general perception that's floating around, you know? Um, so there's that householders versus monastic. So the householders are not expected to take the precepts. They're not expected to do the practice, you know, the poor souls over there, you know, um, but our temple is so progressive because we're actually doing it. And um, Lama is a householder. He has children. He has a wife. He has a business. He has a temple. He's an enlightened being. He's doing it. So we have a story. I have a story that I can follow. I have someone I can turn to that can give me like real actionable advice on the topic. So that's exciting. It's exciting to me. Um, and then I think about the story of Tara, right? This is one of these pervasive stories in our culture. It's like so important to us that there's Tara. She's a woman. She became enlightened. And then a monastic said, well, next time you can be reborn as a man. And she said, no, thank you very much. From now on, I will be reborn as a woman. And I'm like, yes. This is awesome. So she's revered as, you know, the mother of all beings. So if we want to tap into, you know, the, the, the motherhood aspect, we can do mantras, we can learn about her, we can do all of that. But I remember with, when I had Sylvan, before I had him, I came to Lama and I said, um, what do I do? I'm going to be so busy. I'm going to be nursing. I'm going to have a kid attached to me. I'm going to be sleep deprived. Like, how am I going to practice? How am I going to meditate? And he just said, he just said, be Tara. And that, that was really meaningful to me. And it made me realize like, as a mother, I don't have to meditate on motherhood. <laughs> I'm actually doing it. So can I make up a story in my head? Okay, first of all, has anyone heard a story of Tara as an actual mother? Like not just a figurative mother, but did she become enlightened with little kids running around, like squirming on their lap when she tried to meditate? Did they ever put their hands over her mouth when she's trying to say mantra? Because mine do. <laughs> like, did that ever happen? I have not heard it. I have not heard the story of Tara as an actual physical mother, only the figurative mother, except right over there at the back of the room, Lama's artwork commissioned Tara actually holding a baby, a physical child. To me, Lama has, has told that story and has given me that hope and then of course that that rebellious side of me is like well can I create this story where uh, a woman actual mother becomes enlightened with kids running all over the place <laughs> can I live that story you know if I can imagine it then maybe it's possible and then I have all these stories to bolster that right so you know, that's where my head is at with um, the stories surrounding motherhood here. From a DEIB perspective, you know, have I been supported here as a mother? In a figurative sense, absolutely. With the well wishes, with the check-ins, with just the support. Like the temple could remain as it is today and I will keep coming and be super happy to be here. Absolutely. And this is the hard part, but have I been supported in a practical sense in raising my kids? No. Now, we've got little Buddhas coming up. Um, again, thank you, Heather. That's amazing. She's doing it. I'm not. <laughs> um. But this is really important because when you take the kids out, you're actually excluding a large, large 
part of the population, not just kids, but the parents that come with them. So it is important to support the Little Buddhist program. But let me tell you another story. This is the story in my mind that I would like to see happen is that, you know, my kids become so familiar with all of you that you all become trusted adults that I know it's not just me and my husband and grandma watching out for them. There's actually a whole community watching out for them. And Dylan, he's, he's already been watching out for them. But yeah, so I can, I can imagine in my mind, like Kaya being 13 years old and she's got a problem that she's not comfortable coming to mom to, but she'll go to Auntie Jules or Auntie Su Susan or Auntie Patty and talk to them. And I know that she'll get good advice. And if there's something that I really need to know, then they'll let me know. You know, that's that's the story I would like to see for my kids here. So instead of drop, dropping them off at grandma, I will donate my kids to the cause <laughs> and <laughs> bring them here. And I would like to suggest that people that are childless or child-free, that they volunteer to help with little Buddhas because I sincerely believe that that they can be the path because when you spend any amount of time working with children, you're either going to lose your mind or you're going to forgive your parents. A hundred percent. Okay. Or both you lose your mind and then forgive your parents. But anyway, it's, it's, it's very challenging and it brings, like, I probably could have convinced myself I was much more further down the path than I really am if I'd never had kids because I'm confronted with my shortcomings regularly and often, and I have to work with that. So if I told you that the kids were the path to enlightenment, would anyone want to babysit? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to offer another perspective because it benefits everyone, right? And that interdependent, like people who are child-free could experience that in small doses. And then I could get a little bit more free time, which is great for my ability address, to address my shortcomings while I'm in the trenches with my kids every day. So that's the story I would like to tell is like something that we could reach for. So yeah, that's that's my personal experience. I'm bringing it here because really I can't talk to you about the black experience of being here in this temple. I just, I can't speak to that. But I do want to bring up, I, I consulted uh, Hoku Chris Fonten because I was like, I need answers. I don't have answers. And she's been leading this group on racial and social justice for many years. And I thought, okay, she can have some good advice for her, for us. And true to the style of most great teachers, they don't give you the answer that you expect to hear, but they give you the truth. And I must say, she's so beautiful and wonderful. And I hope she hears this talk. Not sure if she's here. Maybe she's here. Anyway, she was amazing. And, and she was basically like, you know what? It takes a lot of time. It, she still doesn't have the answers. <laughs> and she's been doing this for years. And everyone here is welcome to join her group, um, but you have to make a six month minimum commitment to coming once a month and doing the work because that's that's how long it takes. It takes a long time. But she also had some well needed encouragement because I shared with her what we're doing now, expressions, hugely important for diversity because we're not asking people to come in here and convert. We're providing something to the community where we're bringing in more diverse voices. We're listening, we're sharing an experience. So expressions is pretty is on the forefront of our diversity efforts because we're not asking from the community, we're giving. And it's just this beautiful exchange and it brings in diversity and it's just fantastic. So expressions, she's like, bravo, expressions. I'm like, yeah, thank you very much. Bravo for having this talk today. Bravo for um, our outreach group that we have now that's going to start going into communities and, and making friends with other churches. So it's a friendship group, or not friendship group, but a friendship model, as Lama says. So the good news is we're already doing it, you know, and that's that really means a lot. So 
anyway thank thank you for everyone for listening is there is there any questions this is where it can get scary <laughs> yes um thank you so much i i think i just have a comment about uh sort of the the family path versus the monastic path and i think there's actually a lot of literature on how householders with families do do great work and do find enlightenment um and i think maybe we don't read the literature because it is actually in the stories and i think kongshu rinpoche actually brings up a lot of those stories and listening to those stories and, and hearing those stories is actually really important to me because that sort of oral tradition and those stories are something that you sort of got to pick out of the sutras or you got to pick out of little things because just little tidbits here and there. And, and I think they're really valuable. Um, but then as for, you know, monastics are celibate, but you think about monastery life, Think about the kids in the monastery. Monastics are raising kids. Mm -hmm. And it is sort of a different perspective and it is a very different thing. But that is a very interesting relationship to see happen and to see kids come into the monastery and find new parents there. And for people who have no idea how to raise a kid, end up with a five or six or nine-year-old to raise. And they become fathers or mothers to a five or six or nine year old who had a, who have parents and it is an interesting experience for them and i remember the look on some of their faces of what do i do with this little person <laughs> uh and so there is some corollaries in those institutions and in that tradition also about raising children and you know just talking about the experiences of others that we may not think about or that we miss. I think those are two paths that we miss sometimes, that children are raised in monasteries and that householders do become enlightened. Mm -hmm. We just Great. need to listen to them. Yeah, we should say, share more of those stories. I would love to hear that. And that was, that's the other thing, like I think in, um, you know, actually we're, our religion comes from, you know, the temples are have children there. It's actually the American Buddhist temples that don't tend to have the kids running around. So yeah, I'd love to hear more of those stories. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, hi Autumn. Thanks for your talk. Um, one of the things I resonated with was this idea of like humility. And I and I heard that a lot with your um with your talk and and I think that um, when you approach people with some humility, it like opens a door to have a discussion rather than just predisposing that, you know, somebody has a certain perspective. So um, thanks for that. You're welcome. I don't think there's, is there someone online? Oh, okay. Ellen? Yeah, are you ready for my question? Yeah, great. Well, I loved your idea. I, I liked your talk generally, but I loved your idea about more communal raising of our temple's children. And I know um, when my youngest son was young, at one point I told Lama, look, I can't come anymore unless you have a children's program. I can't, you know, I can no longer decide to come to Lion's Roar at the cost of not spending time with my child. And we created a children's program, but what helped the most was connecting with another family that was at Lions Roar that had another child about the same age. And there was some of that sort of co-parenting that ended up happening. But, I, you know, I think our temple is a little challenged in two ways. One is that we're pretty geographically spread out, you know, so it's not easy to just pop over to another member's house with your child and spend time together. And the other is that we have so many programs that were sort of temporarily spread out too. And I wonder if you have any ideas for how we, we, you know, build some depth to our adult Sangha member children relationships, you know, rather than just sort of passing your children 
for a few moments here and there? How do we how do we get ourselves together so we actually build relationships with one another to have that kind of you know depth to our connections? So, for example, your child would at some point feel comfortable hanging out with some of us or seeking our guidance or something. Well, it, you know, to be fair, little Buddhas take, took a big hit in the pandemic. So you think pre-pandemic, little Buddhas had more little Buddhas. So first of all, we need to, to have that where they can actually come. And that's newly started up again. So I would just suggest that people volunteer, honestly, to um, go help out with little Buddhas. You know, it's, it's really that simple you know you'll be put to work real fast and those develop those relationships actually with kids occur very fast it's not like adults where you take so long to get to know each other like if you just show up and you sit there and draw a picture with a kid like your friends like that's it it's so much more simple with kids to even start that and you know Jules is developing a relationship with Kaya, you know, Kaya talks about Jules and, and it really just was her like just sitting down and having a conversation with her um, just one time. And now she's like, is Jules going to be there? Where's Jules? You know? Um, so it's actually very easy to start a relationship uh, with a child. I think. Maybe your children are more extroverted than my child was, but, oh, um, yeah, <laughs> but I are. appreciate the feedback. And they, I think yeah. you have, you're, you're right in a lot of respects and something I wasn't thinking about. So thank you. And thank you for your talk. Oh yeah. You're welcome. Okay. okay. So um, thank you, Autumn, for the, for the, for the talk. And um, what I wanted to say, and I um, wanted to actually bring out was something that you said earlier about asking and that right there as a Hispanic male, I could tell you that that's always the best way to actually come and, you know, to actually, if you don't know something, then just ask. Um, mm -hmm. I've been involved in so many situations, uh, especially even at work, also with the, with the public library, and then also with other groups where sometimes committees are created to, to conduct outreach or to actually to include, but it's so, it usually comes from the perspective of uh, and I hate to say it because it's going to sound bad, maybe, but it comes from the professor, uh, the perspective of a of a white person. So sometimes stereotypes are are in are deeply embedded in that. And so, um, and as Hispanics, uh, I mean, we're so diverse in our own group. I mean, some of us are are of European descent, or we're we're mixed. We're actually mestizo or mulatto, or for example, um, come from African descent or even Asian. So, or even American Indian, if you want to call that, or I should say indigenous, you know. Um, so, so there's a lot to learn and there's a lot there to actually consider. So, so I just want to thank you for actually saying, for actually mentioning that asking is actually quite simple. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's easy. Mm -hmm. It can, it can be very difficult, but um, I think you, you, you're all, all of you will actually be very, um, you find it very enlightening to actually, if you just take that first step, it'd be great. Yeah, so thank I, you. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, and I have to credit Tamara for that because she's what's because I'm always like, what do I do? What do I do? And she's like, ask what to do. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. And creating safe spaces, I think, is big too. It's like you have to demonstrate that that you're a safe place for people to give you a straight answer too, and that can take time. You know. So I would like to bring up a little side story that comes up in my family a lot, and it really pisses me off. Um, so I want to touch on the inequality of races, basically. Uh, there's three main races that I see have a lot of power, and it's not just white people, Asian people, and a lot of Indian people. I see that a lot of problems happen within those three races against people of Mexican and Black descent. And I'm going to touch on 
my family's experience of it. So uh, one of the issues that's been happening over the last couple of weeks is we have me and my cousin living together. My aunt and uncle live across the street. But we're both having issues with children throwing stuff over the fence, toys, trash, et cetera, et cetera. Um, behind my aunt's house, there's a white family. Next to my house, there's a Mexican family. And the amount of shit talking that my aunt and my cousin do on the Mexican family versus the white family is it's it's ridiculous. It really is. And I I always try to get to the cause of things. And like I asked my aunt, like, why do you get so bent out of shape when a child throws a ball accidentally? All you have to do is throw it back over. It's fine. But she pointed out with she was a child, she lived next to an Asian family and they had a beautiful backyard, beautiful front yard, beautiful everything. And whenever she threw a ball over the fence, they never got the ball back. And she was talking about, she was like, she made references that, you know, that Asian family was more well-esteemed or more deserving of respect versus the white trash behind us or the garbage Mexicans next door. And I'm just like, I don't understand that. I, I, I can't understand that because like, you know, when you bring up the idea of being colorblind, like you, someone has two different interpretations of the same experience, but because the source is different things, they're able to talk about it differently, you know? And it's like, I don't know what I'm trying to get at, but it, it, yeah, we just, we have to realize that everyone can do the same thing, but our perception of how that thing is done is definitely altered by race and it, it's unfortunate. And if we could all just live with more compassion and more of, you know, the joy that children live with when they're throwing balls over the fence and having to explore backyards to get it back because the mean lady back in the other yard is yelling and bitching and complaining. It's like, well, at least those children are still holding on to joy and still trying to hold on to like being in a playful mood and with the people that are causing them pain and so I don't know. I feel like that was just a something that I'm dealing with and I don't know how to deal with it I don't know how to like rationalize how so much hatred can just be held within a vessel it just it does not make sense yeah that's there's a lot to unpack in that one I, just, it, I, I don't like yeah, do you guys have any offer of advice on how we can dismantle that? I don't even know. <laughs> I wish I knew. Does anybody know? I mean, yeah, that's pretty ugly to treat one, you know, one neighbor differently than the other neighbor, just solely based on race and culture. That's, you know, that's what we call racism, right? So, yeah, you lie. <laughs> communities that they have um, and all the students know their contributed value, each student had a limited specific section of the assignment that only they had access to. So it requires that they needed to talk to each other as to complete the assignment. And what they found was that like, this is crazy corporate work for like collaboration and work like get things out there. And like that happened too in um Mesa County when they started allowing like black Americans to be assigned.
collaboration. That's key. Yeah. That makes sense. Because at that point, you start working with somebody and you're not just thinking like, the outside you're actually dealing with someone on a human level i don't know is there i don't know it's it's something the people right now it's like i'm like this is not going to solve your problem this is just putting up more boundaries less compassion like we're getting further into a problem with you building up things yeah something to think about is there a way for the neighbors to collaborate on something Oh, and they're collaborating on building the fence. All right. Okay. That's a start. (laughs) Make good neighbors. Yeah. Okay. No. I don't even want to talk about the reason I'm building the fence. It's ridiculous. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Brad. You know, I have a... um... I spent a lot of time with my kids growing up at the um, the Betsuin, the Japanese um, church, you know, the Buddhist church. And it was uh, it was really interesting. Our motive for going there was because it would be a great place for our kids to grow up. There were a lot of kids activities, Boy Scouts and, and Dharma classes for kids. And, and uh, you know, it was really interesting being a minority, you know, because most of my life I, ha- I haven't, I mean, I, I've lived in California all my life and I've been places where where um, there are a lot of different ethnic groups, but I felt I, I went to that church and I was very much a minority. And, um, and I understood it because people get together for like cultural reasons, for ethnic identity, and for historical reasons also. And at that church, I didn't expect um, that people were gonna um, like embrace my background, but I went along with what was going on at the church. And I, and I also realized that a lot of people um, that are similar come together for similar reasons, you know, and, and so I get, and I, and it was interesting too, because I never, um, you know, I made a lot of really great friends. I met a lot of really great people, but I never really felt a hundred percent like a part of that church. And part of it was because there was a different kind of culture and ethnic identity that I, even though, even however much I learned about it, I never really was going to assimilate, but I got a lot of value from it also. And so I kind of wonder in some ways, and and it was interesting how when I came here, I, I felt very much a part of, you know, and so I, I, and I don't, I don't know quite how to articulate this, but at the same time, it's like, part of it is like, identity as people that we kind of glom together and have formations of groups you know and we see that in a lot of other churches in the city too people have an identity as a as a ethnic group or as a as a you know cultural group and so i'm wondering you know we're trying to do outreach to attract people but at the same time you know there's a there's an identity that we hold you know and how much of that i mean i didn't go to the buddhist church betsuin thinking that like they need to try to like do more outreach to to accept me into the group. I went there thinking like, well, this is what they're offering. You know, and at the same time, I have to say that people were very welcoming and open and um, they they accepted, you know, who I was for, you know, for who, you know, my family and who I was. And so, and I, yeah, so I'm, what I'm saying is, is that on some level, there's a, um, there's a part of us that's like, who we are, you know, and then there's a part of us that can open and try to accept people. And so I guess, I guess there needs to be some definition around that, you know, to, to, um, to be welcoming to people, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, because actually, in a lot of other cultures, uh, religion is synonymous with culture or race, right? So I was born religion right whereas in america we're very much like this like individualistic i will choose what religion i want to be but that's not the case in a lot of places so um in a way a a lot of us again this huge generalization 
but a lot of us are kind of the misfits for that didn't fit in in the other really you know anglo christian religions we were kind of like the outside children that found refuge here you know and so we kind of a lot of us have that in common where we just didn't fit into those religions but we have a choice right you know so but it's different because you wouldn't you wouldn't want to try to convert uh, another religion that's another culture into our you know center because if they really identify there then why you know so the purpose of the outreach group from my perspective is not to convert or bring them here but more to make friends and just create connections and and be friendly and you know, maybe in the story in my mind, you know, maybe if we make friends with another church group, maybe we go over there and we could talk about meditation and maybe they come over here and they share, you know, some words from the Bible. Hey, you know, like friendship, really friendship model. But yeah, there is that cultural piece that I really don't want to take away specifically if they are marginalized communities in America and that's their refuge, you know, like that's their place where they're comfortable with people that surround them with love and they don't have to deal with all the nonsense, you know, from the rest of <laughs> our culture, like the fence thing or whatever, you know, so it's so deep. There's so much, so much to talk about. So we got one more over there, and then I think yeah. we'll probably we also have a couple more online. So do you want to oh, maybe boy. set some limits or some time limits? To uh, well, You're let's in charge. Let's. Uh, oof, we're gonna be here all day. Yes. <laughs> That's um, maybe. Okay, I'll take one more from online, and then we'll as you're walking the mic back to um, the corner there. And who was next? Who was the next one online? I don't even know who rose their hand. Elizabeth. Uh, just a suggestion. Um, my neighborhood is super diverse, and every year we have a block party, and uh, that's how we know our neighbors and spend time. And uh, it's pretty kid oriented and it's safety oriented, but it's also gives us the ability to spend several hours together talking about what we do, who we are, who's in the family, who's not, you know, like people don't know if my mom's still alive or not. So I can say, yes, she's still alive. So that's another thing you could do is you could have a, a block party with a focus on maybe, you know, kids or safety or something, you know, or a holiday. That's right, Dylan. Now you're organizing a block party. It sounds like it. Yeah, no, seriously, because sometimes the best way to, and this this goes with kids too, instead of saying, don't do this, it's a little easier to say, do this instead. And then, then you just automatically stop doing the negative thing. It's like, okay, if we create some kind of party or event where we're all getting together doing something positive, then it just kind of automatically makes the things, negativities melt away. Much harder to say, stop being so racist right it's like much easier to say let's get together and have a party okay hello <laughs> hello um i think uh something that i like to remember when i'm thinking about this topic is um there's two kinds of empathy. Uh, there is the kind where I know what that feels like because I've felt that before. You know, I know what it's like to burn my hand on the stove because I've also burned my hand on the stove. Um, and then there's the kind where this person is a human and I know that they're going through suffering and I know that they're going through pain. And I may not know what that pain feels like for them, but I can empathize because they're a person too. And uh, 
So, you know, I'm white. I don't understand a lot of racial pains and the sufferings that many other people go through. But we can empathize with people and we can try to understand that pain through speaking with them and uh, meeting with them and going to block parties and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I think it's always just, you know, always keep an open mind and an open heart. Um, yeah, uh, just keep your heart open to the empathy of other people's pain. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good, good thing to think of. And it's like, you can find a connection with anybody and the pain and the suffering, you know, whether it's on the level of very specific or very general, that we're all human and we're all suffering, right? And then everything in between as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap it up because it's getting, I think that's when we wrap up. And Susan had a, wait, oh, do you do announcements after? After prayer. Okay, let's do dedication next. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrens and Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of the stream of profound and vast instruction to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unpiercing, unchanging, unfading. Avalaki Vichara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Mandrishi, master of flawless wisdom, Song Kappa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Lo Song Drapa, I make requests at your holy feet. Um, just a couple of announcements, and one is a, a follow-up to what um, Autumn has already talked about. Um, Heather and Matt McClellan couldn't be here today, but they asked that um, I encourage people to, um, if you got kids, um, Little Buddhas will start again um, on May 28th, next Sunday. Um, Heather sent out an email, I think, to the general male chimp population um, on May 10th with a really comprehensive description of the Little Buddhas program. So um, I, if you haven't read it yet, I just encourage everybody to read it so that, you know, we're informed as to what Heather and Matt are going to be doing, what kind of how we can support them what the program's gonna be like. Anyway, it's a really uh, comprehensive email. So, and it went out on May 10th. And if you didn't get it, let me know and I'll forward it to you. It's, it's um, really a good description of the program. Um, the other thing that I was just thought I'd mention because I you know, could hear, right? All of this pain around the subject. Um, it's very painful. We have in the back um, a, a, a book of names that you can enter people's names into of uh, prayers and practices for people who are in need. And it isn't just for folks who um, are having surgery or, you know, having um, those kinds of physical problems, but we're all having in some respects, some emotional and, and psychological pain. And so that book is um, to enter names of people that um, those of us who come on Tuesdays to do the Tara practice, we are including those people 
in our practice. Uh, those of us who come to do medicine Buddha practice, we're also including them in our medicine Buddha practice. So um, just think of the people that you know who are in pain um, and are suffering in all sorts of different ways. And there's a way to, to bring them into the temple and bring them into our practice um, by, you know, and you, you don't have to, to put a lot of information, but just enough so that we know that, that these folks needs, need, our, need our prayers and our practices. So the book is back there by the Tara Shrine. Um, and that's it. I'd like to make an announcement now. Uh, so there's a couple of us on the tech team, uh, but our schedules are getting a little bit crazier with some of the personal things that we're taking on uh, and with more responsibilities here at Temple. So I'm extending the invitation. If anyone would like to help out me and Eli and Matthew and Daniel with tech, uh, I would like to get some sort of uh, like roster together where we could just have openings and people sign up to do tech. It's super simple. It's not as hard as we make it out to be, uh, <laughs> but it would be it would be very uh, great for us if we could have a little bit more support there, uh, just as Eli and I are branching out to other areas in Temple, and it would be appreciated. Thank you. Omo araya pasaya na arindi Om araya pasaya na arindi Om